And we're on the air. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is on .NET, a weekly discussion with the .NET team and guests. And uh, today, our guests are uh, Brian and Colin from uh, AppCR. Uh, to talk, they're here to talk today about the NATS uh, server and the corresponding .NET library. Uh, but before we talk about that, uh, we have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, the first one is that uh, starting today, we are actually also uh, publishing the videos on Channel 9. The first one is already online. There is a new on.NET uh, show on Channel 9. And the first video with Miguel de Icaza is already online. And uh, the other ones will be published soon. Um, so that should bring more audience, a more diversified audience to the show, which is a really good thing. And it will also bring some nice features, such as uh, an audio feed. So you will be able, actually, to listen to the show uh, as a podcast, uh, if uh, that's your thing, more than, than you know, spending an hour watching our lovely faces. Um, and the second announcement that I, that I want to make is that we are going to try to get uh, the show closer to the .NET Foundation. And uh, uh, one of the things we'll do is that we'll have uh, Martin Woodward on the on the show soon uh, to talk about the foundation. And in general, we're, we, are, we are going to try to work more with the foundation uh, for the show. Uh, that's it for announcements. We can uh, now switch to, uh, to our guests. So welcome, guys. Uh, why don't you introduce yourselves? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us, guys. Uh, good to be here. So, um, and, and it sounds like an exciting new format to kick off the year with the show. So that's nice. Uh, my name's uh, Brian Flannery. I'm the uh, community manager uh, at Nats. It's a open source uh, high performance messaging project sponsored by AppSera that we'll talk about today. And uh, I'm Colin Sullivan. I'm a principal engineer at AppSera. Um, I've been in messaging for about 20 years. Um, all the way through Tolarian, TIPCO with Rendezvous and EMS and FTL, and now Nats with Upsara. Excellent. Um, so my own personal experience with messaging is, is relatively limited. Uh, what I know is MQTT that I've been using on, the, on um, uh, devices such as the Raspberry Pi. So how, how, is, how is it different? How's Nats different? Or I mean, it's a different. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, what is unique about uh, about Nats? What what makes it uh, what what makes it better? I suppose. It, it also might be good to provide people with um, a, a general idea of the whole domain to start with. Like, um, yeah. I, I'm sure there's some people out there that don't know what any of these things are. Yeah. Uh, including me. Yeah, um, why does it matter, right? Yeah, why, why do these products matter? Why are they Why are they needed? When would, when what kind of situation would you get into with your app where you should say, oh, Nats is that thing that I learned about, you know, six months ago. Now's the time when I should be using it within my app. Yeah, fair, fair, fair question. So yeah, I can help establish just a little bit of context. Uh, and maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the use patterns or you know, where we typically see people uh, considering or using Nats. Um, so Nats was actually created by, uh, by Derek Collison. He's also the founder of AppSera. Um, but prior to that, um, he was a CTO at VMware in the Cloud Applications Group um, and did the original design work and, um, and sort of the original architecture and POC work around uh, Cloud Foundry um, that uh, most people, I'm sure, are familiar with. Um, and at the time, this is about five, you know, five years ago. Uh, of course, there was a big paradigm shift happening in, you know, enterprise computing, not unlike what's happening today. Um, there's a lot of interesting last couple of years things been happening. But long story short, um, you know, needed a a very high performance, uh, simple, you know, um, always available messaging system um, to really power Cloud Foundry. That was kind of the initial uh, antithesis, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, genesis of uh, of NAT. So. Um, that was about five years ago. Uh, we also, in, in AppSera, it also, you know, is, is used internally as a back control plane inside of our product, of course. Um, but this is a, you know, we're talking about messaging. We, of course, don't mean instant messaging. We're talking about infrastructure messaging where when I have applications or services or systems that need to communicate with each other um, uh, and I need to do it at scale, this is where NAS really fits in very well. So the kind of the core emphasis of NAS or the design philosophy is really 
satisfying two things. One is simplicity, and the other is performance. Um, this was sort of the initial design consideration around it when it was, you know, how do we scale up a PaaS like a Cloud Foundry? Um, since then, uh, Nats has, you know, it's again, it's been on GitHub for four or five years, and then Ruby, and then we port, we ported over about three years ago to, to Go, uh, and we have a multitude of clients now. Of course, the one we're here to talk about is the .NET client. Um, but if you think about some of the things happening nowadays, you mentioned Internet of Things. Uh, a lot of folks are looking at microservices architectures, you know, where you're taking potentially a monolithic application, or you might be writing something new, but you're breaking it into many different services. Um, they all need to communicate with each other essentially in real time. Um, and it might be a very distributed architecture. You know, nowadays you don't necessarily know when you're designing an application, there's no guarantee six months from now where a particular part of the application is going to be running. Uh, you know, people are deploying applications to many different cloud environments, many different on-premise, off-premise. So um, you think about the distributed nature of systems today and then just the scale involved. Um, think about some of the things going on with, as I said, Internet of Things, microservices, also mobile computing. Um, you, might have, you might have large companies that want to deliver some, some content to a very large number of subscribers. This is where Nats really excels when you're saying, hey, I need, I need to broadcast um, large number of messages to, 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 to a lot of different systems. I need to do it extremely quickly, and I need it reliable. Like, not, I've not talked to a developer yet, and again, it's obviously my role is, as a community manager. I haven't talked to anyone yet that said, hey, Nats, Nats crashed. You know, it, it, um, there's some very interesting things we do. We can talk about that in order to ensure that Nats is always available um, and protects itself at all costs. really provides a dial tone, uh, system dial tone. So I'll stop there. Um, Hopefully that gave some context, but we can we can dive into that a little deeper as well. So how how does it uh, uh, if I wanted to start a, an application using that, um, would I subscribe to some service? Would I install something on my servers? Uh, how, how does it happen? Well, as a as a application developer, you know, let's let's start from development. We do have a NuGet package, so then you just download your NuGet package and um, um, start developing from there. Uh, you also need a server someplace. Now there's the NAT server, which, uh, which you can run as a container. You can uh, download it via Go and run it that way. But um, those are really the two things you need to get started with. Um, and what's the NAT server look like? So I definitely get the, the NuGet package piece. That, that sounds like a, what I would call a client library. Right. Um, and then uh, the server piece, so um, yeah, so that's some piece of software, not probably completely unlike a web server in its super general nature. Does that run on a Windows box? Does that run on a Linux box? Do I just need one of those, or do I have to scale that server as well? Well, the, the server was written in Go, so you can obtain it via Go, and any place Go runs, you can obtain it there. But then we also have binary distributions for uh, Linux and Mac, and um, um, I'm hoping soon to be Windows. Um, so wh what does the server do? Is it, is it a, like a, a message broker? It is. Uh, we use a publish-subscribe paradigm, so being that you publish a message to what we call a subject, and anybody on the other end listening to that subject subscribe to that subject will receive that message. So um, uh, that's basically the paradigm we use and uh, um, how, it, how it works at a real basic level. Could you actually contrast it? Like we have this thing called um, SignalR that um, is built on top of WebSockets. It feels like um, there's some some similarity in the usage pattern at a super high level. Is that fair or no? You know, to be to be fair, I, I really don't know much about SignalR. So yeah, but you know about WebSockets? I know about WebSockets, yes. Um, so, go ahead. Okay, so so at the base level, um, the the server and the client are are connected via sockets, regular TCP sockets. Um, and we just have a, a protocol built on top of that. That's a clear text protocol, really simple, but yet very performant. And then um, on top of that, what's important is we also layer security if you want, TLS 1.2 uh, security. So 
at this point, um, we're mainly socket-based, not necessarily web sockets. Uh, there's some things we may be looking for, looking to in the future with that. But uh, okay, that, that makes sense. Yes. And what about scaling the server? Um, do you ever get to the point where it's like, oh, I need to have two NAT servers in my organization, or I need to, you know, put this onto a bigger box, or um, does it not typically get to that that point? Well, I mean, for um, for that always-on dial tone, we definitely recommend people cluster our servers. And it's really easy to do. So basically, you start a server, you let it know, here's another server, and they connect, and they're routed. Anytime you need more um, need to scale, you simply add a server into the cluster, and you don't even have to restart. And uh, um, then you can scale that way. Anytime. Oh. And the clients are going to know how to uh, uh, how to talk to that cluster, and uh, it, it's transparent for the client. Well, it is. It, with the client, you need to give it um, the nodes of the cluster it can connect to, and very soon we're working on auto auto discovery. So the client will actually connect to one and know about everything else in the cluster. So um, the client can really actually be brain dead. All it knows is, hey, I'm connecting to a cluster. If something happens, a node in the cluster goes down, um, the client will automatically fail over and switch. Right. So uh, if I'm a client that's connecting to this cluster, then are there just a particular set of categories or names that I'm interested in will subscribe to? So it's those subjects, if I, if yeah. I understand correctly? Yeah. yeah. And you, can, you, can, you can subscribe to a you can use wildcard in subjects. You certainly can. Um, well, let me let me break down the the what you would see in an application flow. So first, as a client, you use our client library and you establish a connection. So with that connection, you give it a uh, NAT server address, which is basically it's in a URI format. You say NATS colon slash slash your host name and your port. And then uh, your client will connect. And then what you do is you can, at that point, just publish away. You can just start sending messages. And one, of the, one of the parameters you use when you publish is a, a subject. You can also uh, subscribe. So then you subscribe. And you, you let the server know, hey, I'm interested in the subject. I want to receive messages on it. So then uh, from there, your application will start receiving messages. You can choose to either handle the messages synchronously or asynchronously, but um, those are really the only things you really have to do in a NATS program. You can get a NATS application. You can get a lot more complicated if you want, but that's really the general flow. Makes sense. Now, as far as publishing and subscribing, there are wildcards. So what you can do, I prefer to think of it almost as a tree or a hierarchy. So our particular uh, syntax for wildcarding involves um, a greater than sign and an asterisk. An asterisk, so if you think of your, think of your uh, subjects as tokens connected via periods, you can substitute any token when you're subscribing with a star, which means I want to receive anything that kind of matches this. Or if you do greater than, I want to receive anything that meets this first part of this subject and everything since. Um, you know, an easy, easy example is um, uh, geography, location. So I've got subjects U.S., Colorado, California, Washington, and then maybe various cities in there. If I want to subscribe the messages just for a particular city, I would do Colorado, or U.S., Colorado, Denver uh, as my subject. If, let's say, I want to get everything for Colorado, I just do us.colorado.star. Mm -hmm. Everything for the US, us.greater than, everything possible, just a greater than. Uh, that makes sense. Can you tell us a little bit about the, um, uh, so we were just talking about subjects. Can you tell, Can you tell us a little bit about the payload and what data type is those for? Um, the data types really dictated 
by yeah, I think so there are Oh yeah, a bit of connectivity issues here. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. Did you hear the question? I did about what sort of data types. Yeah. Yeah. Does NATS NAT, uh, natively support? So in NATS, at, at the core level, and th this is keeping with the the NATS tenant of simplicity, we um, we really send everything as bytes. Some of the client libraries do a bit more, allowing you to pass strings. But generally, in the protocol, everything is a byte. There's no types. What we do is in the client libraries, on top of that, we offer a feature we call encoding. It's really in the .NET uh, world, it's serialization. And uh, that's how you can type stuff yourself in your application. Um, one of the features we off also offer is overriding the serialization. So let's say you have your data, your object, and you want to send it. Well, you create what we call as an encoded connection. Works the same thing, same way as a connection, just that um, you pass it some methods to or delegates to serialize. Then what happens is you can override that, and let's say you want to do JSON. Well, then what you do is you take your object, serialize it into a JSON string, pass it along, and send it. On the opposite side, um, you deserialize the JSON and build your object out of that, or deserialize your object out of the JSON, I should say. But the application is is responsible for plugging in the the, the serialization that it wants to use uh, to exchange data, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. So this this would be how you would communicate, say, between the .NET application and the Python application, for example. Exactly. That's a great use for it. Right. So by default, you you, you can just uh, I mean. From what I've seen from the client library on, on .NET, uh, it's very idiomatic. You can actually just you just give it objects, and it seems to magically take care of serializing and deserializing that. And that is really nice because the the, the programming model looks very natural. Uh, but from what you're saying, I understand that I can actually th that wouldn't work, for example, to communicate with other technologies, right? No, not unless you overrode, you know, like exactly. I said, overrode things to do do some common format such as mm -hmm. uh, uh, JSON or, or uh, protobuf, whatever you want. That right. So it was the idea that, um, uh, say, Bertrand was using Python and I was using .NET because I'm I'm the smarter one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the boss. Yeah. That's no. Right. No. Uh, this is a small joke. Uh, uh, and we, yeah, so we had these two um, apps that were talking to one another via NATS. Is the basic idea that um, if we were doing the, like, you know, country.state.city kind of thing like you talked about, that we would have to agree on what the payload was. Say it was a whole bunch of lat long um, information. Then we would have agreed on that so that he could, I would serialize it a particular way, and then he would deserialize it, and that contract would be understood. Is exactly. that fair? That's okay. fair. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, this sounds like a good system. Like not too much um not too much forced on you. No, I mean you can you can literally write an app in about four or five lines. Yeah, and I was gonna say you mentioned IoT, it was interesting a couple since you just mentioned Python. A couple weeks ago it was a great uh, IoT talk at a Python meetup actually, but uh, where they were connecting a bunch of Raspberry Pi devices. A guy named John Lockwood did it in the, in the developer community, but uh, there's a blog post. You, you can find his blog post, but I believe he said it took him four or five minutes to get everything set up, and he was off to the races. So I think that, uh, uh, yeah, we're very serious about simplicity. In fact, we're pretty judicious about sometimes we'll have requests or things we're thinking about from a functionality standpoint where we really say, you know, we really want to keep NAS extremely simplistic. You know, right now we've had out, you know, external third-party benchmarks on you know, seven, eight, nine million messages a second, and I know Colin's uh, .NET client that we've been really impressed with the .NET performance um, and just what it's, the platforms enable. But you know, I know on his on his laptop, you know, on a virtual machine, was seeing four million or north of that uh, message a second. So really, the simplicity is is is, is obviously a, something we take very seriously and maintain the performance and scalability. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, that's impressive. Does one of you have uh, maybe a speaker that is uh, a little too loud? We, we are we are getting some echo here in the audio. Uh, is it still there? No, nope, that's better. 
Okay, good. Hope sorry about that. Hopefully that wasn't too uh, too painful to listen to. Then I don't know when the echo cut in or out, but uh. Uh, it was mostly when we were talking. But um, uh, yeah, I was I was talking about performance and and saying that uh, this is really really impressive performance uh, and. Uh, I, it would be interesting to uh, to understand how you're you're achieving such performance. And I, I know you guys are. Can we talk about the work you're currently doing with Core, or is it too early to to talk about? Oh, too late. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, well, you know, first off, let me say the support you guys have given us in in and uh, our development with Core has just been been phenomenal. I mean. Within a day, you guys are responding. I'm really happy with that. Uh, with the core stuff, I think we're getting really close. We're getting really close. There's just a, a few things I think we're waiting on. Um, but 90, I ran the uh, API port tool, and I think over 90 some percent of the calls were there. And and we actually use a lot in our library. So so we're very happy. Um, hopefully, pretty soon. First off, core is definitely on the road. Definitely on the road. And Hang on, let me go on mute myself. Uh, yeah, I, I, actually, actually, no, that's that wasn't you. <laughs> All right, I'm not guilty. I'm coming off mute. Uh, do, do you have headphones that you can use, maybe? Let's see, Colin, you say, or uh, Colin, go and say something. Okay. Okay. I don't think we're good. Okay. Okay. Uh, All right. I'm definitely. I'm definitely. Feels good. Let me. All right. I apologize about that. Uh, let me try something. Well, I think it's gone. I think it's gone. Yes. Hmm. What? Where are we saying? Yeah, we were talking about core. Uh, core, yeah. So um, you know, again, the, the great support. We're almost there. I think we're Very almost cool. there. Very cool. I, I, I the hope you, you will have some uh, opportunities to further improve the performance. Actually, with core, uh, there are a few features coming up in in core that that hopefully will help you guys. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on. Um, Reducing allocations and making sure that you can, yeah, you can you can work with streams of data uh, in very efficient ways. So I'm sure that will be very useful to you guys. You know, I, I bet it will. We do uh, we do some string manipulation, and uh, particularly if you guys are doing anything with uh, um, reducing copies of uh, bytes when you're doing array copies, that sort of stuff. That would that would go a really long way for helping us. That's definitely a focus. And uh, if, if you have data to share that with us that, that actually uh, could help us you know, focus on the right things, that, that's also very useful. Yeah, we definitely love it when um, uh, customers or partners come to us and say, um, look at this particular code path. You know, here's this performance trace. We are not happy with this. Please help us with this particular thing. Um, that's helpful. You know, when someone comes to us and just says, my application isn't running fast enough, you know, that's mm -hmm. a fairly vague kind of statement, not to suggest that that um, emotion is misplaced, but um, uh, when someone's done the work to drill down to a particular code path, that's very helpful and, and enables us to be a bit more effective in helping you. I, I can absolutely see that. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, going through the code, going through the code path with performance tools, profiling, even just eyeballing, and uh, some experimentation um, to go through and pair out any additional copies we were doing, try to um, reduce memory allocations. One thing in general I'm, I'm actually I'm really impressed with with .NET is how well it reuses objects um, that haven't been picked up by the garbage collector. So so the object reuse is just, you know, once you, you I, I'm guessing apparently there's a pool of objects that haven't quite been collected by the garbage collector yet, and .NET seems to reuse those very efficiently. 
What what led you to believe that that was happening? It wasn't as fast as adding pooling. Or, I mean, adding pooling wasn't as fast as .NET on its own. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, that was one of these, oh, wow, wow, wow. Good job. Actually, it would be interesting to understand exactly what's going on there. Yeah, um, I have to admit that that sounds... Um, uh, I wasn't aware that we did some automatic object pooling. I know that our, our garbage collector definitely tries to do a good job, but I wasn't aware of the second part of it. So that might be a, another thing we could um, discuss separately about this particular thing where you think it's doing a great job and maybe get a bit more clarity on why you think it's doing a great job. Sure, sure. And again, I'm making an assumption. I don't know what the mechanisms underneath um, is, are being used in .NET, but uh, you know, I did, we'll just say I'm impressed there. Okay, it's a good place to start. Uh, so another feature that that's coming is uh, buffered arrays, where mm. you can you can actually reuse uh, buffers uh, in, in interesting ways. That that's another feature that that might be interesting for you guys to look at. I think that is already available on GitHub. Um, yeah. Uh, there is a part of the of the source tree where the experimental stuff lives. Uh, I'll, I'll try to put a, a link in the in the yeah. description after the show. And uh, isn't that going to be in the our next in the in the RC? I don't know. Okay. I thought ASP.NET had moved to using that. Maybe I don't know. Okay. So that was one of the things communication-wise. I noticed that. Uh, the t default TCP buffers um, were were you know su sufficient, but by increasing the size of the buffers, I was able to really get a lot more throughput. I'm talking four to five times mag magnitude. And uh, is that eight? So one would think that that was not a .NET specific thing, but more of an OS thing. Is have you not seen similar effects elsewhere? Yeah, yeah, not as um, I, I, you know, I would have to look, compare our C client, but um, um, I will just say that was one of the first things I did that really boosted performance. Hmm. Is, is it maybe the case then that the baseline imp uh, implementation, uh, that might actually, okay, the baseline implementation was maybe, um, maybe there was something wrong with it to cause there to be such a big gap? Um, you mean the, the implementation, the original Go client, or you mean my, my first pass? No, I meant when you um, went with the default TCP buffering, maybe there was something wrong with it that caused the gap to be so big when you increased it. I have no idea. There, there could be. There could be. You know, what one of the per performance profiling is almost an art. You know, you just have to just sort of keep trying different things and kind of guess what might work, what might not. It's a lot of uh, uh, quantitative testing um, and hypothesis testing yeah. at times. So that's one thing I just thought I'd mention. Uh, makes sense. That's that's positive. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get the lights right. Yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe... <laughs> yeah, we're having... So not a difficult. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> so I, I have a question. Um, back to kind of application architecture, which is, um, you know, I, I have more experience with, say, yeah, I have some experience using Azure, and I know one of the services they have there is Azure Azure Q, and the basic idea there is it's a um, app to app communication mechanism. You you basically push something into the queue to say, you know, this is work that someone else is supposed to do or some other type of information. And then the other app, you know, it it, it does the opposite. It pulls, pulls things off the queue and acts on that particular piece of information. Um, and that, that's a good system. I'm wondering is, would NATS potentially be a, um, an alternative to that or, or that's kind of a different use case? Well, a, a queue is really one-to-one -one, uh, communication. And you can have multiple apps pulling off of a queue. It's a great way to distribute work. 
Um, but we're really pub sub. Now, what applications can absolutely do is define unique subjects and communicate that way if they want to do the one-on-one. -on -one. Or we even have built-in request reply, which isn't a queuing model, but just thought I'd mention that. Um, one of the things a queue generally implies um, is, is a new feature that's coming out in Nats uh, soon, which is uh, persistence. So um, I just wanted to offer that, that as we have persistence, to emulate a queue, you could define a unique subject between your applications. Uh, you push into the queue. At the other end, you pop off, and uh, the applications can come and go. Uh, yeah, the persistence, I didn't bring that up. That was definitely something I was thinking about. Uh, I know in the, the queue scenario, you can imagine someone uploads a picture that needs to be... Um, you know, crunch down to some smaller um, size or it needs to be facial recognized or something like that. And you really want to make sure that if servers reboot, that that particular piece of information isn't lost. And so I, I assume that's kind of where your persistence scenario would fill in as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you mentioned compression. That would, that would be another great use case for our uh, encoding. So as part of your serialization, you compress. Um, so what happens when, um, uh, when a client goes down, for example, and then comes back, back up online? Are there uh, ways to recover from uh, that, that kind of catastrophic scenario? Well, the, the core layer of NATS is really simple. So the, the client would need to, the, well, let me, let me rephrase this. With the simplicity of NATS, there's really no state maintained about the clients. So when the client comes back up, he needs to establish all of his subscriptions. Um, um, if there's any messages that were pending, he needs to send again. Um, and that is something that uh, we are going to address with the persistence coming up. Um, but right now, we just prefer to keep it really simple. So it, it's all about real-time communication and whatever is uh, is published, I, I just consume that. But uh, So in that way, it's very different from a queue, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, at least sense. right now. No. Um, what, you know, one thing, if we're talking about... Um, you know, clients crashing. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the high availability of the NATS cluster. So let's say a client's publishing messages, and its member of the it's it's the server it's connected to in the NATS cluster goes down. Well, the client will automatically try to reconnect to another server. You know, assuming you configured it that way, it'll automatically try to reconnect to another server in the cluster. So what we've done is, in the spirit of simplicity for the application programmer, you can keep sending messages. And the client library will actually buffer them. And when you reconnect, it'll, re it'll send them. So okay. it makes transitioning in the event of uh, failure, you know, your machine goes down that's hosting the NAT server, it makes that transition seamless. So is there a notion of transaction in there involved or? No, no, we don't really have any, uh, you know, without state in the server, we don't really have any any concept of a transaction. But you, you, there is an acknowledgement from the server to the client saying, yeah, I got your message. You, you can have that. There is a mode that's um, called verbose that can actually, it'll send a message back saying, I got your message. Yeah, I, I'm asking because in MQTT actually, there you have you always have that choice of you know sending a message with acknowledgement or not, and so on. So. Yeah, you know acknowledgement when you have sort of the always on dial tone, um, and you're you're sending a message, um, the acknowledgement is more important when you have the concept of persistence. So I want to know that this message is guaranteed. Um, what we do is we suggest with core nats, uh, we've got very, very easy to use request reply mechanisms, very, very easy to use publish subscribe. So um, with core nats, always on dial tone, 99.9% .9 of the time you're fine. That one 
percent of it or you know that very very small percent of the time where one of your machines goes down or something like that and there is a transition um, your applications at the application level can always send messages for uh, uh, remediation there right it's kind of the difference with um, you know the old telephone system that was circuit based as opposed to packet based um, you know that had uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, with with our persistence work coming up, we're going to address a lot of these issues. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about some of uh, some of your customers, maybe, and give uh, give us an idea of um, uh, the the kind of application that that takes benefit from from that? Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, there's sort of two or three major sort of, uh, I would say, use case patterns or types of scenarios we're seeing uh, NATS use pretty heavily in. Um, you know, so one I mentioned already was Internet of Things. Um, of course, uh, it's it's still early days in the Internet of Things space, but there's also already some, some pretty interesting companies using NATS. Um, one is a company, you know, this whole maker movement that's uh, that's come around. Um, there's a company called Little Bits. Uh, that's very popular in the Internet of Things and, and, and maker movement space, but um, really great uh, community member there named Paolo Perez and his team. But they're, uh, you know, they, they use NATS essentially. Um, I'm getting an echo. Yeah. Let's see if that helps. Yeah, cool. Um, so you can imagine all these devices they have out there um, and the amount of data just every second that they're, they're generating. Um, using NATS as a transport to transport the data back to a monitoring. Uh, in a reporting tool that they have, um, we there's there's a few very large uh, Internet of Things, you know, IoT in the home companies as well uh, that are using that um, for communication and starting to do PLC work around communication of uh, large scale IoT infrastructures. A couple years, uh, pardon me, a couple weeks ago, by a company called Next Gen Leads, I believe, out of San Diego, and um, Aaron on their team wrote it, but. Uh, this is a company where think of if you're a you know you're a, you're a really large company and you want to get leads, um, so lead aggregation. But you want to make sure that you know you're not coming in right after someone who's just called on these leads. You want to make sure that they're fresh. You know every every second counts. It's literally a matter of you know seconds or split seconds. So it's a lead auctioning system. That's sort of their core IP. Um, but NATS is what they use to con you really allow all of the services that 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 you think of all the complexity involved in real time auctioning or near real time auctioning. So NATS is a microservices transport there for those guys. Um, Bridgevine is a company in the southeast. Um, um, you know, Andy Andy Stone gave a good talk at the December. We had a meetup in Atlanta in uh, I think actually early December. Yeah, um, we spoke about how Bridgevine's using it. This is a company that does customer interaction portals. So you think of uh, um, large companies like Directv's and Comcast of the world, where you know whether it's on your phone or through their inter you know through their website or what have you. Um, and they're also using it um, sort of as the pub sub. They call it a sort of a hub for uh, connect all their all their uh, microservices on, on on their infrastructure. And he gave a really great talk that's on SlideShare about that. Um, financial, you know, we've got a few financial um, that I've recently spoken to companies in the financial services space. They're doing like, for example, I'm getting an echo again. Yeah. Um, we, we think about any event-driven transaction. So. Awesome. Sorry, is that tolerable, you guys? Too much of an echo. Okay, see me okay? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. I'll see more than on my side. I guess the echo is on my side. But yeah, starting to, uh, you know, again, that's another area where we're seeing a lot of a lot of interest and a lot of adoption is is, is in the financial services around. You know, I, we we talked a lot about messaging. Which, I mean, but the key is also it's secure, and that's extremely secure. It's it's very fast secure messaging, so it's not only interesting for that. Internet of Things use case, but also a lot of um, transactional companies in the finance space are, are, are also using that. Um, so hopefully that kind of helps give a bit of a picture. Uh, the other thing I would mention on our mic is uh, the Docker image. It's, you know, one of the widest, smallest, if not the smallest uh, images in Docker Hub, and um, um, extremely performant, extremely simple. Um, seven megabytes, I believe, is the image. But but I t a lot of people that I talk to are using. Docker in their microservices architecture for the communication between the containers to set up the sort of a microservices transport. Um, and of course, everybody's 
in a container for now. Uh, a lot of them are using NAS as a, as a container, uh, microservice transport. So hopefully that helps a bit. Uh, just give you some, some context on the conversations I have with some developers in the open source community of companies using that. Cool. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Matt is asking, uh, can you talk about your experience with Go? And in particular, have you missed not having generics? <laughs> um, I, I've been, been coding in C Sharp for many, many years. And um, actually, Go is somewhat new to me. So, um, so did I miss it? Yeah, not, not, not so much. I, I find that um, Go, Go is a great language. It's a, it's a very terse. Um, but having come from the object-oriented world, um, you know, pure OO, it's, uh, you know, it's, they're different animals. I'll just say that. Yeah, different idioms and different habits. I'll tell you what, every time I go back to Go, I, I keep, uh, keep running into semicolon problems. Okay. Um, so another question is, how does each node in a cluster talk to each other? Uh, some, something like protobufs. I don't know what protobufs are. Uh, that's a serialization okay. technology that's really low level. It, it is. Um, so the, the, the servers talk to each other using actually the same clear text protocol that's used between the client and the server and the client. And um, what they really do is they propagate, if you think about the information that needs to be shared amongst the servers in a cluster, it's really subscription information. So they do propagate that. So let's say a client subscribes to uh, subject foo on server A, and there's a cluster of server A, B, and C. Server A will let server B and server C know about these subscriptions. So if you think about it, the servers actually subscribe to those messages to, to the uh, originating server that allows the message flow to go through. And um, that's really some of the, the extent of the uh, server communication that goes on. There's pings and pongs, um, keep, you know, essentially keep alive, if you will, just to make sure everyone's up and healthy. But um, um, apart from that, it's the same communication you would see in, to a client. OK, so you have, of course, uh, information that's, that's flowing around to maintain the, the health of the cluster. But otherwise, uh, the, the servers in the cluster basically also subscribe and just rebroadcast uh, what the other servers are, are getting. Is that correct? Yeah, well, it does it intelligently. So interest is only propagated where it needs to, so that um, information, you know, your messages aren't necessarily spread throughout, spread to nodes of the clusters that don't really need to have them. Okay, so it will, it knows what uh, subjects the clients that it is connected to are interested about. Yeah. Uh, so it it kind of has the same subscription that it's on. Uh, it's it's an aggregation of the subscription that some clients has. You know that's that's a great way to put it. So okay, um, because I I was wondering actually how this was scaling with the number of messages. Yeah, because no, that's great. If they are all broadcasting everything, of course you you that's don't get much by clustering, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're all doing the, the same thing, and it would be very chatty. So that okay, that 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 explains. Yeah, and if you, go, if you go to like nats.io slash uh, documentation. You can, you can. There's a section that we talk quite extensively about how we handle auto printing the interest graph and some of the things we do. So, yeah, if you guys want to give me a, a list of links uh, that I can put in the description, uh, that's great. Um, okay. So one thing that's interesting about that architecture is you actually use your own product. So um, <laughs> uh, at the point that it was poorly performing, you would very much um, experience that. So, I mean, obviously every product provider is motivated to provide a good product, but when you're forced to use it yourself, I think it provides an extra incentive. Oh, absolutely, you know, and 
I don't know who came up with it, and you hear it all the time, eating your own dog food, and probably everyone's tired of hearing it, but it's it's true. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, uh, can, can you talk about how Absera is using the product? Yeah. So uh, Absera is a product called the uh, Trusted Cloud Platform. Um, allows you it handles multi-cloud. Um, think of the orchestration around multi-cloud deployments. Um, so ensuring the uh, doing it in a policy uh, way where you're automating IT policy and then sort of handling all the complex governance questions and issues that might might come up, uh, particularly if you're running you know distributed workloads in a few different environments. Um, but uh, that product, um, Nats, is used as the uh, you think of it as sort of the control backplane in the product for handling communication between the different components of of, um, of the Trusted Cloud platform. Um, and again, so any yeah, any issues around scalability, speed, and anything really, since it's 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 really the, the guts or the core of the uh, of the entire um, product. So we would we would definitely experience those in spades. Uh, fortunately, uh, you know, and I can tell you honestly, as as a community manager, having been speaking to developers in the NAS community for eleven months now since I started, but uh, I've yet to talk to anyone who said, you know, hey, NAS NAS crashed, right? So. They might have filed, you know, obviously it's software, they'll file other issues, or we'll, we'll, there's other things sometimes, and workarounds and things, but no one has yet said to me, you know, hey, I was using NATS and it crashed and I really didn't scale. So we haven't, and, 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 and the trusted platform products well on the, on the uh, at Epsair, we've not experienced that either as a result. So that's been good. Does that answer the question? Uh, does that help? So if you think about sort of the logical components of, of, of the product, NATS is the control backplane that's handling all the communication. Um, and, and all, of, all the messaging um, in a secure messaging handling, kind of the relaying the uh, what needs to happen. If that makes yeah, sense. Uh, and I think it's it's interesting to see how a lot of the um, interesting and innovative things that happen uh, uh, in the tech community nowadays are oftentimes driven by a company that is using that that innovation internally. You can see it with. Facebook and React, you can see it with Google and Go. Um, you guys, uh, a lot of innovation here is driven by Azure. Oh, for sure. uh, it, it's very interesting. And it's interesting for the users of those technologies as well because it it kind of solves that, that problem of uh, uh, where is the technology going in, in five years? And it's still going to be there. Well, you know. We kind of depend on it the same way that you guys do, so that gives the guarantee of. of uh, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that really excites me about the Nats team, and uh, you know, I ha I'm I'm not one of them, but but certainly every you know our core engineering team and kind of the core group we have around it. I mean, as Colin mentioned at the beginning of the call, but um, um, everyone's got decades of experience in in, in enterprise messaging. Um, so, well, I should, I should clarify, yes, I'm part of the core team, but core engineering is what I'm referring to, people with, with decades of uh, experience of engineering. So that's really exciting, too. Um, it's a great team, but we've also got a great community, and it's uh, one of the things I like about my job is, you know, constantly meeting new people that are, have great ideas. They've given us a lot of great feedback on the roadmap, and, and, and you know, obviously, so it's host kind of so. so going more meta for a, a moment, mm -hmm. one of the things um, I kind of noticed with uh, our own customers is um, actually maybe you can mute your mic for a snack. Yeah, let's see if that works better. Um, yeah, one of the things I notice is a lot of our customers over the last you know five ten years wrote monolithic applications. You know, you have a single say ASP.NET website on the server, um, maybe maybe a service, um, and uh, we're starting to see. Um, those monolithic applications kind of separated out. It seems as you kind of make that progression, uh, that's where this becomes interesting, is in, um, I guess, component applications. Is that fair? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, um, so I was actually at the uh, at SCALE, the Southern California Linux Expo, uh, last week, Thursday through Sunday. And um, gosh, it seems like every, every third person I talked to maybe or Maybe even half, but but everyone was saying, look, you know, we didn't start our company, you know, two weeks ago, right? We've been around for a while. Um, we've got a bunch of, as you, as you put it, sort of monolithic applications, or however you might want to refer to it. Um, and when these were designed, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of the frameworks we now have that are, that are tailored really well to certain specific 
use cases, you know, we didn't necessarily have the, uh, we didn't anticipate the, uh, the usage volume, the frequency of updates, we'd have to do all sorts of things. Um, and, and so you raise a really good point. Um, a lot of people right now are saying, look, how do I break these out and decouple my ar architecture into a bunch of uh, services that are running and functionally, functioning together as a, an application, but um, it's all about uh, simplicity and, and simplifying, and as you said, getting getting smaller, the kind of that minimizing that footprint. Um, and that is where NATS actually fits in really, really well because it is so lightweight. You know, obviously you don't want to try and do that and have a microservices architecture where you have a very heavy, complex, um, you know, chatty messaging layer. So um, it's it's a very common uh, pattern that we're seeing uh, and certainly something that NATS is really well suited for. Yeah, NATS was, uh, NAS was built from the ground up for the cloud. So there's very little com configuration. It tries to do everything it can automatically and scale very well, in particularly to address uh, microservices. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about uh, what about uh, Internet of Things devices? How how small can you go? And uh, what, can can you give us an idea of the the, the smallest um, kinds of devices that that you've seen Nats running on? Well, I know Raspberry Pi. Um, Brian, has there been something, anything smaller yet? No, that's real popular. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about it. I'm sure there has been. You know, it seems like it seems like everybody right now is trying different things with IoT and sort of wrapping their head around it. And there's so there's, the good thing about that is there's all sorts of experimentation. Uh, lots of the meetups I go to, a lot of exciting, uh, exciting you know demos from um, from the meetups. Yeah, the most common one I certainly see is the Raspberry Pi. Um, anything on Arduino, for example? Yeah, yeah, you know, folks are starting to look at Arduino, um, and I, yeah, I've seen a, I've seen a few demos. I've talked to a few people that are that are you know looking at that. I'm trying to think of anything smaller in terms of here. Um, yeah, I don't think anything smaller than Arduino. Um, well, on the other hand, I mean, if you're running on the Raspberry Pi today, you know, with the the, the recent uh, commercialization of the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, it actually, I mean. It's difficult to find a device that is actually cheaper than that. But. Yeah, that's why I was struggling. I saw it's like five bucks, right? Um, yeah. um, but that's a really, really common one. You know, I mentioned John Lockwood demoed it. I also went to a meetup in October in Barcelona where uh, there's a developer there named Eric Pinto. Uh, he gave a fantastic demo of, you know, he set up Raspberry Pi, one was monitoring the, It was basically how would you use Raspberry Pi in your home. The one was monitoring, it was a light sensor, the other was a noise sensor. Uh, the other is measuring temperature, you know, and these were all communicating real time with NATS. Um, seems to be a very common one. Is the Raspberry Pi? It's uh, and of course, you know, you don't want it in the internet of you know to try and kind of an IoT use case. You know, you because a lot of these devices, you hit the nail on the head. They're so a lot of them are really they don't have much processing power. They're not going to have a lot of complexity to them because the whole point is to have simple devices uh, and and just lots of them. Uh, NATS is a very good good for that because it is so lightweight and, and simple. And, uh, when we talk about Internet of Things, there is a topic that really comes up and it should, uh, which is security. Do you, do you, can, can you uh, tell you a little bit, uh, a little bit about how uh, your customers secure their data using that? So, so um, there's really two approaches. So built into NATS right now is TLS 1.2 uh, with the latest encryption suites. Um, if people have to relax things, there's there's options they can use to use older ones, but uh, but we are all about security there. And then um, the other thing, um, you know, that's going to be really interesting is in the pub sub world, when you're when you're broadcasting to millions of devices, how do you secure these? How do you know that the message I sent came from the publisher? And how do I decrypt that? When when uh, I've got millions of subscribers, so these are, these are really really difficult problems to solve. Um, but you know, one approach is to be less focused about maybe encrypting the connection. You know, if you can, awesome. If you can't, well then you know the payload definitely needs to be encrypted. So there's a there's a number of uh, things you can look at in that respect. Um, maybe with class level encryption. Um, um, there's there's a, a couple different things, but uh, yeah, encryption comes up and it's it's not an easy problem to solve. Yeah, I, I hear you basically saying that's an application level concern. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be great if um, it, it's something that needs to be addressed, and uh, application levels can certainly do that. Uh, it's it's something that they, as since they know their their ecosystem, know what the uh, uh, economy of all their applications are, they can determine that fairly well. Although, um, you know, it would be an interesting problem for uh, Nats and Absurd to look at solving. Yeah, and I would. Um, there actually will be a meetup in March uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, so, for anyone who's interested in the local, great. If not, you know, we will, uh, you know, obviously live stream that and, or provide the content after. But uh, one of the guests, one of the speakers from the developer community, is actually going to talk about how you handle secure messaging for IoT devices with Nats. So, um, if anyone's interested, just FYI, certainly something people are doing. Do not sign up to, uh, using Nats and starting to look at how do I solve that problem. Excellent. And uh, actually, we're almost out of time. Uh, are there any um, any news that you want to share or announcements for the, the, the near future that you want to talk about? Well, well actually, um, go ahead, Carl. Oh, <laughs> I mean, we're definitely we're definitely looking forward to uh, uh, wrapping things up and getting Nets running on core. Uh, you know, I'm excited to see the performance numbers we'll get out of that. And then, um, you know, we're, we're kicking around some other things, uh, maybe WCF findings. And uh, but we would love, love to hear from the community. What do you guys want to see? Uh, what would you like us to do? You know, and and contributors are are welcome. Uh, just one probably um, almost silly question, but uh, right right now with your <clears throat> done a framework client, that would be uh, limited to running on Windows. I'm assuming with Core that you're intending to uh, support that on all three operating systems? Um, and do you expect that to be um, kind of uh, interesting to your customer base? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, I, I, you know, absolutely. I think in this day and age, you know, I, I think uh, trends certainly are you don't you don't typically, at least at large scale companies, run into too many people running everything on. You know, I'm running. My environment looks just like this, right? So um, certainly, I think I think having that uh, that breadth is really is going to be really interesting. Great, absolutely. Cool. Well, um, thanks a lot for being on the show today. Um, I would love to be able to announce who will be our guest next week, but I don't know yet. So <laughs> it's a good problem to have. We have a nice backlog going, you guys. Thanks for having us. It's a fun show. Yeah. Thank thanks you for very much. Thanks for being on the show again. That 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 was great, and I, I'm sure a lot of our uh, listeners have um, are going to be interested in discovering what Nats is about and uh, and trying it. Thank you very much. Well, uh, as Colin said, you know, uh, if you just go to nats.io slash community, there's a bunch of ways. Just pop on in, and we're, we're pretty engaged. We're looking forward to hearing from people. So, but thank you for having us on the show. It was great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye now.